Every year, India finds itself in a new tax controversy. The Vodafone litigation consumed the early years of this decade, capped by the retroactive tax amendment in 2012. Then came the shell shock and transfer pricing trouble in 2013. Last year, the BJP made the UPA's tax terrorism a campaign issue, only to find itself now facing similar allegations. Over the last year or so, foreign portfolio investors have been asked to pay minimum alternate tax or MAT on past capital gains. Now, the applicability of MAT on foreign companies in India is admittedly a vexed issue, but few ever thought that it would apply to foreign portfolio investors. Faced with requests for clarity, Finance Minister Arun Jaitley said in this year's budget statement that hereon foreign portfolio investors will be exempt from paying minimum alternate tax on equity capital gains. But this prospective relief implies that past revenue demands are valid and thus has created a 40,000 crore rupee tax controversy. Well, joining me on this edition of the firm is Forrest Kaka, Siddharth Shah and Bobby Parekh. Gentlemen, to all three of you, a very warm welcome. My first question to you, Bobby, is to, if you can explain to us the magnitude of this FBI mad problem. There are all kinds of numbers going around, going all the way up to 40,000 crores. I don't know whether to give credence to any of these numbers because it's impossible to calculate. Is it a really big problem right now based on what your clients are telling you? So, based on what our clients are telling us, it is actually, it could become a very big problem. I don't know what the numbers add up to for this year, uh, but the year that's been uh, assessed to tax right now is the uh, year of assessment 2012-13. Okay. Uh, so, there are uh, 13, 14, 14, 15, 15, 16, so there are already three years of tax returns which have been filed, which are still to be assessed, uh, okay. where the position is already established, and they can go back another two, three years. Uh, uh, so, you know, so you have a six, seven year period uh, which in which all of these provisions would apply. The question is if they, you know, how many of these investors uh, come from Mauritius uh, or from Singapore or from Netherlands or um, Spain or France or wherever there is an exemption and therefore the position that seems to have been taken is that MAT will not apply to those FIIs. Uh, the MAT provisions would also not apply to FIIs which are not constituted as companies. Hmm. Uh, so, you're, you know, two categories of FIIs are excluded from the uh, scope of this action right now. Okay. Uh, now, how much does that leave? And how large is that over a six or seven year period? Uh, you know, I don't. Uh, it's not. It's not that easy to be able to model it. But I would sort of hazard a guess that uh, it can't be insignificant. So tens of thousands yeah. of crores. And one thing I'd like to say is that if you remember, if you go back in time, you must remember that for each year you go back, you have a 12 percent interest yes. on that, which is automatically added. And I mm -hmm. think in three years that becomes itself nearly 50 percent of the tax. Correct. So as you go longer in period back, the greater. And I've seen in some cases that when you're really talking about six, seven years, a significant part of the principal could get wiped out with just the interest liability. Okay. So I, I want to go to the history of how this became a problem, uh, and that is MAT. MAT was introduced over two decades ago, withdrawn and reintroduced in 1997. The current MAT section, 115 JB, was introduced in 2000 and says if for a company the income tax payable is less than 18.5% of its book profit, then its book profit will be deemed total income and taxed at 18.5%. But was MAT ever meant to apply to foreign companies in India? I don't think there was any intention. It started out in 1997. And there, in the FM speech itself, he makes it clear who it is applicable to, and it is clearly not non-domestic companies. Hmm. So when you go back in time, it is clearly for widely held domestic companies. And if you look at the provisions explaining that bill in 1997, it dealt with either deductions like depreciation or Chapter 6A, where you really reduced your profits and did not pay tax. But at the same time, you had high dividends, etc., profit-making company. It never dealt with a situation where you pay a tax, like STT, which capital gains you do actually pay, and then it qualifies to be exempt under Section 10. So MAT was never intended for these purposes. What started out as a minimum alternate tax, now with the removal for deductions on SEZs, etc., is become a thinking of a minimum tax. So I think from the point of view of the revenue, it is clear that MAT is now not an alternate. 
it is a minimum tax that you must pay irrespective of whether the item has already been taxed and therefore the exemption is given under section 10 so no double taxation or whatever is the reason you must pay a minimum tax Okay, but even in 1997, Siddharth, there was an AAR ruling, the details of which I couldn't fully read because the ruling of PDF is not available anywhere. But there was an AAR ruling that said that MAT does apply to foreign companies. But that specific ruling pertains to a company that had a business presence or a permanent right. establishment in India. So I'm trying to reconcile the fact that this seems like a recent controversy. But actually this question on whether MAT applies to foreign companies or not dates all the way back to 1997 when the provision was introduced? That's correct. So, I mean, I think very clearly applicability of MAT vis-a-vis -vis the domestic entities, and I think that was obviously the legislative intent with which the MAT was introduced, where entities showing higher accounting profits but not showing tax profits hmm. were the ones which were intended to be targeted. Hmm. And that also to an extent included foreign companies which have a fixed place of business or a permanent establishment in India. And those entities to a great extent vis-a-vis -vis their income in India would be treated at par with domestic entities. Okay. It was never intended to extend beyond that to cover foreign companies which may have investment income but have no investment, uh, no presence in India or a permanent establishment. But the moment India. you opened the door in 1997 itself uh, by saying that it applies to foreign companies that have, with the caveat, a business presence in India, the fact that you're allowing for it to apply to foreign companies then becomes an established position from 1997 itself? I, I would not tend to agree with that. Okay. I think the principle there was where ex essentially even if you are a foreign company, but you place maintain a place of business in India and earn income arising out of that place of business in India. To that extent, you should not be treated any differently from any other domestic entity hmm. because as far as applicability of minimum alternate tax is concerned. But that still does not mean and extend that it would cover all foreign companies with no presence in India would be covered and treated at par with domestic entities. Would you agree with that, Forrest? Right? Because I'm trying to understand whether the issue has snowballed only now over the last three, four, five years, especially because now it's FII or FPI involved, or has it been the position since 1997 of the government, maybe in unstated terms, but definitely of authorities like the Advanced Ruling Authority, that MAT does apply to foreign companies, but with the caveat, if you have a business presence in India. But foreign companies are included within the jurisdiction no, of MAT. I think when we reconcile the provisions in, th in that time, the question was, how do you apply? Because MAT requires a certain computation provisions. It requires sure. accounts to be prepared in a certain manner. The only requirement as far as foreign companies goes, if I recollect in that time, was I think under the Companies Act, if you had a place of business, you were required to draw some part of your accounts up. So therefore, the only question was, if you possibly had, it could only apply in those circumstances. Okay. In my opinion, it was never intended to apply to foreign companies. It could apply at the maximum to companies who have to draw up their accounts in accordance with either a regulator or something under the Companies Act. Bobby, you have a view on this? There are eight or nine rulings on this subject. Yeah, uh, some where companies yeah. have the permanent presence on the ground, others where there is no presence on the ground. But there are no other judgments. So it's not that there are only nine foreign companies operating in the country. So yeah. it's not as if MAT is something which is a widespread issue. It's applied in every case. Uh, otherwise, we would have had hun hundreds of uh, judgments and hundreds of decisions and hundreds of cases going on all over the place. Yeah. So it is a, you know, and, and the view of the AR at the end of the day is binding on the tax department and on the taxpayer for that case. Yeah. Uh, that clearly the, you know, n none of the taxpayers otherwise seem to have taken that view. Uh, and none, neither has the tax department taken that view. Matt has received mixed verdicts in the last 20 years. In 1997, the AAR held that Matt does apply to foreign companies. But in that case, the foreign company in question had a business presence in India. In 2010, in the Praxair case, the AAR held that Matt does not apply to a foreign company with no business presence in India. Praxair was also granted treaty benefits. In the same year, the AAR, in the Timken case, reiterated its stance to say, since the US-based applicant did not have any business in India, it did not need to prepare financial accounts in accordance with the Companies Act, which is a fundamental requirement for the levy of MAT. But the position changed in 2012, when AAR Chairman Justice Bala Subramanian opined that Section 115JB applies to all companies, 
and that if book profit computation cannot be done, the long-term capital gains may itself become the book profit. But the AR did not give any final ruling in this application due to other technical reasons. And that's why the 2012 Castleton decision by AAR is now what revenue relies on. Here, Justice Bala Subramanian ruled that MAT applies to a foreign company irrespective of whether or not it has a business presence in India. He said that practical difficulties for foreign companies to prepare accounts as per the Companies Act is no reason to whittle down the scope of the section. There have also been two tribunal decisions pertaining to Indian branches of foreign banks and in both the tribunal benches held that MAT was not applicable to foreign banks. In fact, the Mumbai tribunal said where a taxpayer is not required to prepare its financials in accordance with Schedule 6 of the Companies Act, MAT provisions should not apply. Yet, revenue prefers to wield Castleton, extending it to foreign portfolio investors as well. Firstly, Castleton was not strictly an FII or an F it FII. Wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah. So I think to use that as the kind of uh, the, the, the torchbearer would be firstly wrong. No. If you look at slightly later even in SD company, the recording of the AR is that the decision of the Tim, of Timkin, which is against the revenue, has been accepted by the revenue and they are not challenging this position on MAT applicability. So I think the question is really the revenue has to, AR SSEs may go for a certain comfort level. They may lose, they may win, as Bobby said, it's not binding. But ultimately, it's really for the revenue department. Did they intend MAT to apply to FIIs? Hmm. If it was never intended to apply, it can't sort of probably have some cutoff period as of 2015. I think it should have been done for all points in time. You're referring to the clarification, to the clarification in the budget this time round. Correct. Okay. Clarification. Correct. It's an amendment to the yeah. act. It's not a clarification. Yeah, and, and, and these are important words because yes. I think that's what the yeah. government is going to rely no, on to be able to litigate this. Clarification is very innocent. It's an amendment yeah. to but the Bobby, act. here I would still like to use the word clarification. Why? Because ultimately it must be the government's intention. That's if they intend, again, I, I'm not speaking for the government. The point is, did you intend it or you did not intend it? If the answer is the latter, then it then must be clarified. On this intention stuff, because much has been made up made about the intention. Uh, from the time Matt was introduced in 1996, hmm. uh, and the explanatory notes at that time said, uh, you know, I propose to introduce a MAT in case where the total income of the company is computed after availing all eligible deductions is less than 30 percent. The total income of such company shall be 30 percent. The and will be chargeable to tax accordingly. The effective rate works out to 12 percent of book profits calculated under the Companies Act. This is the explanatory memorandum when the MAT provision was introduced. 12 percent is derived by taking 30 percent mm. and applying the rate of tax that was prescribed for domestic companies at that time, which was 40 percent. Mm. The rate prevailing for foreign companies at that time was 55 percent. So if the, you know, this is a very if specific, very specific calculation, this is the effective rate of tax works out to 12 percent. This is in 1996. In 2000, uh, uh, he said, the new pro when the, they made some changes to the provision, the new provisions provide that all companies having book profits under the Companies Act prepared in accordance with Part 2 and 3 of Schedule 6 shall be liable to pay or, uh, minimum alternate tax at a lower rate of 7.5%. Seven, as against the existing effective rate of 10.5% of the book profits. Hmm. The 10.5% of the book profits again was 30% uh, of the book profits and the prevailing rate for domestic companies which was 35%. So you're saying that you the, know, in the way uh, they have calculated the tax rate, they have only taken domestic companies into account, how much more therefore leading you, you to believe to be? that foreign companies were never meant no, to be You don't have to lead, lead yourself to believe. He's saying therefore the effective rate of tax is 12% or 10.5%. So, I definitely think from a policy and the legislative intent perspective, and I think as Bobby laid out uh, and uh, Porus as well laid out, it was never intended to cover FPIs as a part of the MET net. And you look at it from a you're message making a distinction. You're saying FPI and not FDI. So you're saying it might That's still it. cover FDI. So I think maybe we can, we probably may have to deal with it because this issue can ultimately cascade into what all forms of foreign entities hmm. would get captured within it. So yeah. I think for the moment, if, even if you look at FPIs and generally as an intent, when you are exempting long-term capital gains for investors, when you are reducing a withholding tax on interest for foreign investors, all along, it's 
very clear that you are not intending them to offer that income to tax at the rate of 20 percent because if that was the case that intent should have been made very clear to foreign investors and that's a legitimate expectation from foreign investors when they are investing into a country that tax law should be certain mm. now keeping all of that in mind I definitely feel FPI as a category from a foreign portfolio investor perspective and looking at the way they operate in terms of where funds regularly trade, invest, exit, their investors may entry, enter and exit at certain point in time. To now go back and say this was always the intent, to say that the mat was applicable to you, you should have offered that income, though you claimed 0% long-term capital gains tax, you paid STP, but hang on, you had to pay 20% tax. And I think that's definitely unfair for the foreign investors and I would definitely hope that the minister would have clarified that as a part of the budget rather than... Okay, I, I want to add, Bobby did some calculations to show that the way this is worded and calculated, Matt, was never meant to apply to foreign companies, right? The other argument has often been that, you know, uh, to compute Matt, you have to compute book profits in a certain way under the Companies Act. If you were a foreign company, you never came under Schedule 6 of the Companies Act, therefore you com couldn't compute those book profits in a certain way, therefore MAT could not have applied to you, right? In 2012, in the Finance Act, they seem to have made an amendment to say that, well, you don't need to compute it under, in a certain particular way under the Companies Act, thereby sending out a message saying, even if you were a company that was not under the jurisdiction of the Companies Act in India, you would still have to compute book profits and you would still have to pay MAT. Would you say 2012 was the game changer here? No, I would not, I don't think so, because that rectifies a situation where different companies within India prepared their account under different statutes because they were covered by different regulators, either the electricity companies, etc., etc. They didn't prepare it in accordance with it. So it, to cover that, 2012, really, the amendment came. But the issue is the definition of company in the first part of the section, hmm. that still remained the same. The point is that even today, the foreign companies do not prepare any accounts in India at all, whether under a regulator A, B, C or D. They don't prepare anything. Secondly, if you will see the provisions of the section, like subsidiary losses, things like that, they don't, they don't deal with a specific individual who has a transaction with India as opposed to someone who has a business with India. Hmm. So I think the whole objective of MAT is to look at kind of a parent company kind of situation which is operating within a country and not with uh, with people who have transaction specific relations with India otherwise hypothetically if you receive a royalty at a lower withholding rate yes. you should not receive a 10% rate you should receive an 18% rate because that's the minimum tax yeah. forget the minimum alternate tax so I think we somehow lose sight and today MAT has become what I call empty minimum tax and that I think is wrong because even the legislature will have legitimate reasons for giving a low withholding for interest, giving a low withholding for royalty. Hmm. You never intended then match to come back through the back door and make it 18% again. And you know the other thing, uh, Manika, is that if 2012 was regarded as opening the door for... I'm just asking because yeah, I yeah. one of the lawyers no, brought just, up in you know, yeah, some of no, the conversations I've had. And fair enough. And I, and I think that you know the point uh, to think about there on that is that if it was really meant to say that therefore uh, this the way that uh, that amendment should be interpreted is that if you're a company maintaining accounts under any other applicable law, hmm. which means that if you're a foreign company and you're maintaining in the, maintaining accounts as per your applicable foreign Companies law, Act, yeah. then those accounts will be the starting point for the purpose of the application of MAT. Hmm. Right? So, if I'm a if I'm a fund which is uh, which is a you know a global fund investing in multiple jurisdictions, I might let's say have funds under manage, uh, a corpus of five billion dollars of which some amount might have been invested in, in India and the rest have been invested around the world. I do maintain accounts as per whatever is the local regulation. So I will take those accounts which actually will reflect the investment results of investment activities of five billion dollars, hmm. okay, of which let's say a billion dollars has been invested in India. Now, I have a profit let's say made on capital gains or whatever it is of a hundred million dollars on my entire corpus. That's my book profit. Hmm. This requires me to say that, okay, you, you've made uh, maintained accounts, you take those accounts, if you read that, uh, that amendment in that way, and you take that book profit, and to that book profit you make okay. the adjustments that are prescribed in the Income Tax Act, yeah. which is this, you know, remove subsidiaries, remove yeah. some of those things, yeah. none of which will apply to a foreign fund generally. Right. 
and therefore if you made 100 million dollars of uh, profit uh, then you must pay tax mat tax on that 100 million although the indian component in that 100 million might be 5 million dollars 10 million dollars or might be zero or whatever so it might maybe be maybe you have to compute the indian component would isn't no, that how it's now where does be? that no so where does that come out if if this amendment is saying that if you maintain accounts as per any applicable law and if that was meant to cover a foreign company maintaining accounts as per its uh, company law or whatever regulations that apply to it and if that has to be taken as a starting point, nowhere is then there is no adjustment which so says that we must adjust really out of the book. Fully flawed. Yeah. I'm just trying to get from 96, 97. Here is Matt. It does not apply to foreign companies, or at least explicitly does not apply to foreign companies. To 2015, here is Matt. It applies to everybody. Yeah. I, I'm saying, how did we go do that distance? I Correct. Mean, and, and, and what and happened? The, the rates were always higher than the Matt tax, so therefore you were paying tax, and that tax was higher than Matt, so we never invoked Matt. It's in 2010 when the uh, mat rates went to 50, rose because mat rates kept on going up and on the other hand the rate of tax on capital gains kept on, I mean it came down, right? Okay. So, so that's when it became material So in 2010, was, in 2010 was when the mat rate became 15%, my short term capital gains were 15% but my long term capital gains were zero. zero. So that is the first point, at in, that was an inflection point potentially where you could say that look now your rates are uh, uh, are lower. Uh, and therefore Matt should apply. What is the feasibility of any of these FPIs or FIIs paying this tax actually? I mean there have been several difficulties that have been raised over the last few months saying look you know these are profits going back to three and four years ago. We've redistributed those profits to our unit holders, to our other investors. Now you're asking us to pay you know where do we bring out that money from? Funds may have closed down in that time, or that specific sub fund may have closed down. So I'm just curious, how are they ever going to cough up this tax? Or does the tax department not care? As in the Castle Till ruling, where you know uh, the judge says that how you compute is not my problem. The I, difficulty I, is your problem. Exactly, and I think this has to be obviously looked at it by the government from a larger uh, perspective. That is this something which is practically implementable for funds who may have wound up. Is it practically implementable? I, Your clients how, must be telling you whether it's practically So today funds which have been wound up, who do you go after? Because funds have a definite life. The directors. Fund, directors, <laughs> foreign directors, <laughs> you'll be basically proceeding against those directors to recover claims on income which was not earned by them. I think you're sending out a message to the world that we are the most difficult place to do business by giving out such an index. Curiously, Budget 2015 does not exempt FPI investments in debt from MAT, nor does it exempt foreign companies or foreign venture capital funds or any other foreign transaction or payment. Will now MAT apply universally? Well, from what little I've heard, if you're going to wait for Castleton to decide, the answer is yes. But I think you have to clarify it for everybody else because you've taken a view that on the present wording, however it is, it applies to foreign companies. You meaning the government of India. Yeah. And so foreign companies, PE, exactly, FBI, exactly. royalty, any, fees for any, technical you services. Need, you, need to make it, you need to make it clear because if that's the intention, fine, tell people up front that you have to pay minimum 18% tax in India and then they'll work. Well for the last time. seven years. That's the problem. That's for the, the last seven years. Actually, no. That's where I no. That's 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 the problem. There was a royalty that, well, there was yeah. a period when it was 10, then they went back to 25, then they've come back, come to, back 10. to 10. So, yeah. so be, maybe, yeah, okay. But, uh, and all of this for foreign companies will apply prospectively as well because the exemption prospectively has only it's been offered to FPI and equity. That's, that's, that that's creates a problem by itself because then you're carving out one sector for prospective. I think you have to take a policy view. If Is MAT applicable to all companies? And if so, then make it clear from the beginning that they have to pay 18% tax. Again, this is a problem. We had these stray cases, Castleton, Timkin, you know, people wanting clarification, some lost, some won. But still, I don't think in Bobby and they would have. It wasn't something of an industry view where the revenue went after every single foreign company with Matt. So people were aware of it. It was there was it was in the background. But I think the wisdom was that no, in all probability, you ought not to be liable. Now there's a view that no, no, you're clearly liable, but prospectively you won't be liable. I just feel that that's something missing. And again, just going back to the principle that you remove long-term capital gains tax. Essentially, at some level, the intent was also to remove arbitrage on entities relying on treaties hmm. to basically encourage them to come and invest directly into India. 
all you are doing now, and when it's the current position that MAT is not being extended to treaty jurisdictions, what is the message you are giving out to the world? Hang on, I think you are still better off using treaties to that extent for investing into India. And you are just giving out a conflicting message. Okay, so is treaty protection valid in, this, in the no. current circumstances that we have discussed? Uh, both for FPI, FDI, FVCI, if you came from Mauritius or Singapore, etc., would you be saved, you know, so, the wrath of Matt, if I may call it that? I think as things stand today, I think very clearly in terms of notices being issued out, a lot of them have not been issued to entities which have offered themselves to tax under the treaty. And I think the principle there being the Section 90, which also is a notwithstanding clause like 115 JB. Hmm. So there are two notwithstanding clauses uh, in that. Jocelyn, yeah. So to the extent as an assessee, if I have a choice to offer myself under Section 90 to say I claim the benefits of a treaty, I'm entitled to do so. And maybe that's probably the basis under which they may not so have... So Castleton is silent on whether MAT gets treaty benefits or not. The capital gains bit gets treaty benefits, that's what Castleton says. But all it says towards the end is that MAT applies to all companies, irrespective of the practical difficulties, you know, and, and that's it. It doesn't say whether you can claim a treaty benefit on MAT. Can you claim a treaty benefit on MAT? Will I the would, government give you that treaty benefit on MAT? I would think so, because MAT is, ultimately MAT is a part of the income tax statute. And normally in the definition of most of our treaties, you will define as to what is income tax meant. And it would be tax and anything which is similar. And MAT is certainly a part of the Income Tax Act, so it would be covered by the treaty. And therefore, if the treaty gave you a relief on anything, it would cover a MAT provision also. Okay. So it doesn't matter whether you have a PE in India or not. It doesn't matter if your transaction took place on exchange or off exchange. It only matters if you come from a country which gives you treaty protection. If you do, if you happen to be from Mauritius, Singapore, Netherlands, then you're protected against the wrath of MAT. If you don't, then MAT applies to you as well. Is that a fair understanding of the current problem facing FPIs? As, as it stands right now, yes. As it stands. Okay. Great. What judicial process does this go through now? Foreign portfolio investors will have to agitate, what, all the way up to the Supreme Court? Court, so we have to wait for a decision from the Supreme Court on Castleton? Well, Castleton will work its way by itself. It's an opinion of the AR. But I think all these investors will have to go either to the DRP or to the CIT and take their route. If there's 148, they'll go by way of writs to the High Court. I think going directly by way of a writ to the High Court, looking at Vodafone's experience when they went back to the DRP, they may be a little reluctant. Okay. But again, it's going to, this process is going to be time consuming, there's going to be demands, it's going to be, it's going to be quite unpleasant. So this is now going to have uh, occupy and consume so much mind space of so many people around the world uh, who have to figure out what they have to do. So now we have issues of, you know, if I'm a fund uh, and I have this uh, draft assessment order that has been issued, should I be making a provision for this amount in my uh, account? So that means that there is an immediate NAV impact. Um, is it appropriate to make a provision for this thing? Uh, uh, you know, and should I be providing for interest because I'm going to not uh, make a payment now? I'm going to litigate it. What is that liability going to work out to? There are penalty notices which have been issued. So, am I will I also get levied a penalty? Will I not? Uh, some funds have received 147 notices for past years, and the notice, oddly, at least the ones some that I've seen, are only for one year. Uh, 2010 11. So, hmm. you know, uh, why not for the intervening years? No idea. It's even more confusing when there is so much inconsistency in the actions that are being taken because, see, so all of these things become uh, matters of interpretation. There will be auditors involved, legal opinions. If I start creating provisions and then a few years later we find that this is not applicable, then I'll have mispriced units all the way through. Then I will misprice units again when I re uh, release this uh, thing. Maybe it's small in the overall context of what that fund's corpus is. Maybe it's significant. So how do you, uh, uh, you know, so is it a big issue? It is a big issue. On that Harris yeah. and tired note, I will wrap it up here. General, <laughs> thank you very much to all three of you for joining us. And thank you very much for watching. We'll be back with The Firm next week. The Firm. India's only show on corporate law, tax and audit matters.